Whenever I've built composite bows, which is only a handful to date, uh, I've never grooved. And Jeff states that about, uh, I believe it's one third of original composite bows were probably grooved. Uh, which, what that does is create more gluing surface contact to absorb all those stresses. And I could never figure out how it could be done. And after watching what Jeff's doing here, it just it's so simple. So we'll just let Jeff explain to us a minute exactly what he's got and what he's doing. Okay, what I've got here is a, a guide that has a ledge on it that guides the tool. It has a trough that's slightly concave that the belly of the horn fits into. And I have a, a tool that's made out of, this particular one's made out of an old saw blade that's got 12 teeth to the inch, and what I've done is grind those teeth down so that they're perfectly triangular, little right triangles, right angle triangles, 12 to the inch, and I've made a handle out of maple that that fits into and I can move from side to side. I bind the horn into this trough and I decide which part is the straightest that I plan on keeping for the bow, and I slide this back and forth in the trough and that's all there is to it. Once I get all the grooves started and they're perfectly straight, I can take them out of the trough, I can bind it onto the workbench, and I can scrape with a hand scraper, which is made out of the rest of the blade of the saw. These two pieces together, this one to start, this one to finish, allows you to make these grooves almost perfectly straight, and uh, 12 to the inch perfectly straight grooves, triangular grooves, and there may be um, Oh, a thirtieth to a, maybe a fiftieth of an inch deep at the very most, maybe a fiftieth of an inch. This will double your surface area for gluing, or actually it increases it to 140 percent of what it would be if it were flat. It uh, allows the horn to be bound onto the wood without any sideways slipping. It gives a real tight fit, and it's actually very easy to do. You could make a grooving tool with a machine shop, with a milling machine, cost you quite a bit of money to do it on a computerized milling machine, or you can do it by hand, spend a couple of hours uh, cutting out the teeth, and get a job that uh, the tolerances are to within a couple thousandths of an inch, which is more than sufficient for this job, because the glue line is a couple thousandths of an inch. So the restart, I just make sure that the tool is in one of the tracks, and I cut. Once a certain depth is reached, Jeff has turned his uh, form over, tied the horn to the opposite side, and now he's able to exert more pressure. His grooves are deep enough to keep the teeth within. And you're going to take them down, what, to the full depth of the teeth on, that you have, Jeff? Yeah, I just sight down the grooves and make certain that they're ground to a point so that they're not flat topped. And once I reach that, everywhere along the entire length, I figure I'm finished. You can see the straightness. There may be, if you look at it edge on, you may see a real slight wobble in one or two places. But uh, if you hold a steel straight edge up along them and sight along the straight edge, you don't see any bends, any wiggles. They are dead on, perfectly straight. And Therefore, you have to realize that your eye is able to discern differences down to thousandths of an inch easily. The glue line is going to be five to six thousandths of an inch thick. So you are well within the, if you do things this way, you're well within the tolerances of the glue line, and you're going to end up with a very good joint. All right, you spend how much time? Now, you've only spent, what, two hours, two and a half hours on this? Yeah, maybe closer to three, because we started it earlier, and... Uh, ground away on it, but then that's three hours with a couple of breaks in between, sitting back to uh, have a soda or a cup of coffee. This is about the sixth uh, bowl that I've done this way, so uh, a little bit of experience has made it go faster. But you don't have to do things this way. You do not have to put these grooves in. The only reason why I'm doing it is because this particular style of bowl that I'm building is uh, a quote-unquote replica 
of a uh, Middle Eastern style of bow that did have these grooves. And in fact, uh, only Turkish and, and Korean and a couple of other isolated uh, nations built bows by putting these grooves in. You can make the back of the wood, or rather the, the belly of the wood and the back of the horn perfectly flat and smooth and join them together. Or you can cut them slightly concave, convex. And uh, I have a grooving tool that is concave uh, for the wood and convex for the horn with teeth cut into it that I would use to make a Turkish flight bow. So this particular operation you can regard as being optional and it was not practiced by all the makers of these bows, but it does give you a very good joint with a lot of extra surface area, and the strength of a joint depends on the surface area of contact. Okay, and then transferring this over to wood, it'd just be a piece of cake now, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, the wood itself uh, grooves much more readily because it's coarser grain, it's a softer, softer material, uh, the, the tool bites into it more deeply, I have had to sharpen the tool once or twice while I've been cutting this into the horn. Why don't you explain a little bit, Jeff, about okay. how you're getting that line started. Well, what I've done is clamped a, a guide to the edge of the bowl and put something underneath it to support it so that I can get the grooves started at least on the curved section. The flat section I can clamp into the guide the way I had done with the horn. But this curved section can be a little bit of a problem, so I use a slightly different method of just clamping a guide onto here and scraping the grooving tool along the guide to cut a series of guide cuts into the wood. And once they're a certain depth, say a quarter of the way down into the tooth, maybe a little more, I can take this metal strip off, just an old hacksaw blade, and then cut the grooves normally. Okay, you can see the grooves now, how they match up, nice and straight, parallel. This is what's going to give the glued joint a little bit of extra strength, increases the surface area, keeps uh, the piece from slipping sideways when we bind it. Uh, the next thing for us to do is to gently steam the horn while it's clamped into place on the wood so that any little deviations will be brought to conformity. Then we size it twice, let it dry, heat it up, put the glue on, and bind it in place. What you see here is the bond that we're looking for between wood, which is on the top, and the horn. And on the left has a sinew layer. This is a cross section of what we're building, what Jeff is building. What's being done now is Jeff is resurfacing right now the core. He'll do the exact same thing with the, uh, the horn so that you have a completely free, uh, sterile environment for the glue to stick to. Alright, Jeff is right now putting a sizing of hide glue. This is pretty liquid, right? Yeah. Very liquid, yeah. Right, very, very liquid good. hide glue. In fact, it's so liquid he's painting it uh, to size the horn and the core prior to bonding. Now, these have both been preheated. He uses these electric heating pads and does it quite a while. Uh, when I have built mine, I've just heated them by the stove. Yeah, in fact, as he has a bow heating by the stove right now that we're going to send you. Uh, the heated part absorbs the glue much better, and now these have to be dried completely part of bond, uh, the actual bonding process.
Jeff has said, this is madhouse time. This is when he screams and goes crazy, folks. Things are falling all around. You may have to disregard his language. Things have to go fast at this point. The sized pieces are being glued. And then things will really get crazy. You watch the tools. We'll try to explain them later. Everything has to be perfect at this point. The bow horn have to be kept warm. These things are put together. The grooves have to be lined up exactly. And then clamp. Now comes another hairy part. The word perfect used once. Success. Jerry's holding the, a vice like clamp. Jeff is going to bind it. Tools of his own invention through trial and error. He's done this himself on seven bows. See, I'm bottomed out on my clamp. Okay. This is crucial. Jeff's got approximately 150 hours of work up to now just in what he's doing. Oh, that joint, getting a couple hundred pounds per square inch on it this way. It's extremely uniform pressure all the way across the surface of the whole piece. Clamps alone just cannot do it. Probably just collapse in the very edge of that piece of horn, but I don't care. I don't care. You're anchoring your tool in place, you say? Yeah. And now you'll steam it. Now I'll steam it and correct it to see if it's twisted, it is, is twisted. But I just steam it and untwist it and it'll be fine. It's uh, not using glue in other places it is, but God, it looks like a really good joint. It's joined real tight everywhere. I found where we, we did crack the very edge of the horn, but it's in a really insignificant place. And it's in a place that's going to be bound off eventually anyway. That kind of stuff happens because you put so much pressure on these things with that tool. Yeah, it looks good everywhere, Jim. Well, that's why we did it. Well, Jeff's getting steam out of that pot. What's this doing, G Jeff? All right, just in case the glue gelled while we were binding it in place, I'm heating up the horn side because it's, the horn's a good conductor of heat. And that will hit, transmit the heat into the glue. The glue will re-liquefy and squeeze out of the joint. That way we make sure that we have a, a thin joint. We only want about a thousandth of an inch glue line, a couple thousandths of an inch glue line. And so I'm just trying to gently heat up that horn side a little bit just to make sure that if we had gelling, we correct for the mistake. Gives a better fit. 